Season 6 is the concluding season of Better Call Saul. In my previous videos, I focused on the character analysis of Kim Wexler and how growing up poor influences the way she dresses, solves problems, and works to fight injustice in the legal system in the first five seasons. I'll link the playlist either in the description of the video or link it above. This will contain spoilers if that's something that bothers you, and I'll also use the names Jimmy and Saul interchangeably throughout as Season 6 flipped between these two. Jimmy and Kim may be from similar socioeconomic backgrounds, but their paths have different trajectories. With that, like, subscribe, grab a snack, and with the supervision of Mothra the Bunny of Data Science, let's discuss. That's where I saw the leprechaun! Right, a leprechaun. He told me to burn things. Uh-huh. In Season 5, Kim Wexler's trajectory led to professional burnout and exhaustion. Depending on the source, recovering from burnout can take anywhere from a few months to a few years like five years. I left a high-stress job in the public sector three years ago and I'm still recovering. Burnout makes us more susceptible to things such as poor decision-making and self-sabotage. At first glance, Kim's life in Florida may seem bland and non-eventful, but I would argue that it's a chance for her to recuperate and take the time needed to analyze the decisions she made and grow her confidence back. In many ways, the paths that Kim and Jimmy take in Season 6 are reflected in the title of the first episode, Days of Wine and Roses. This is the name of a play by J.P. Miller, later adapted into a movie in 1962. The story centers around a couple as they succumb to alcoholism and how their lives take different paths at the end. Joe is steered toward alcohol through pressure from his boss at work in order to fit in. Joe then leads Kirsten toward social drinking when they date. Their descent into alcoholism results in Joe losing his job and Kirsten accidentally setting the apartment on fire after passing out. As a couple, they make an attempt to be sober, but it is short-lived. Joe manages to maintain sobriety longer and is willing to reconcile if Kirsten stops drinking, but is unable to do so, stating, quote, The world looks so dirty to me when I'm not drinking. The movie ends on a somber note, with Joe staring out into the night after Kirsten leaves her husband and their daughter. Jimmy is intoxicated by money. Kim is fueled by more of a sense of justice and revenge. Their energies feed into each other until their scheme results in Howard's death rather than embarrassment. The more money Jimmy earns, the more he's willing to compromise on ethics and legality. When Howard's life ends, it's a wake-up call for Kim and she separates herself from being an attorney and divorces Jimmy. Her time in Florida is not just a chance to recuperate from the stress of her career, it's an opportunity to meditate on her life thus far. However, Jimmy is unable to escape the allure of wealth after representing Walter White and other nefarious people until it gets him into trouble with the feds and he has to hide from the law. In episode 10, when Jimmy finds out that Kim turned in her law license, he pleads with her to stay and that they can put the incident behind them. She explains to him, quote, You asked if you were bad for me. That's not it. We are bad for each other. Jimmy, I've had the time of my life with you, but we're bad for everyone around us. Other people suffer because of us. Apart, we're okay, but together, we're poison. For this final season, I want to discuss how all the little fires combined together led to Kim starting her next phase in life a bit wiser and a bit more optimistic. Don't say revenge. Don't say revenge. Uh, revenge? That's it. I'm getting out of here. In the first episode, when Jimmy meets with Kim at the end of the day in the restaurant where she was meeting with clients, her anger towards the wealthy being able to escape consequences is clear in how she describes the case. Her client is a high school senior who was unknowingly roped into a crime by his rich friend. The rich kid coerced her client to be the driver because what young kid wouldn't want to drive a cool car? He stops at a liquor store per the request of his moneyed friend, and as the client is checking out the bells and whistles of the car, the rich kid is inside committing robbery. After doing so, runs out to the car and tells his friend to floor it. Again, what kid wouldn't want to drive a nice car really fast? Kim doesn't say what their names are, and that's not what's important, but it's worth noting the rage in her tone when she calls the rich kid a snot. While we don't know the extent of the friendship between the two high schoolers, the parents of the rich kid hire a lawyer with lots of money from Denver, Colorado to represent their little urchin, pinning the entire thing on the poor kid even though he never entered the liquor store. Even going so far as to say that the poor kid tricked their precious little Richie Rich into the situation, Kim works to try several tactics to help the case move in her client's favor. Previously in the episode, Jimmy set aside a suit jacket, tie, and shirt for Kim's client to wear in court. The common saying may be, justice is blind, but justice and juries are not, and sadly, guilt is often dependent on appearance. In previous seasons, Kim is seen working with clients to help them appear more trustworthy with nicer clothes and better grooming, heavily aware that this will impact the outcome of the case. When Jimmy says it sounds like a day from hell, Kim smiles and says it was one of the best days of her life, and clarifying that she means professional life. The previous seasons have tracked Kim's professional growth and how much she wants to provide justice to those who would not otherwise be able to afford it. It is often a solitary fight, as we are not shown any other attorneys putting in the same efforts to show support for defendants like Kim does until the end of Season 6. 
When Cam does get support, it's usually only Jimmy. She still holds some resentment towards Howard, telling Jimmy that there may be a way to move up the Sandpiper settlement, which would give them a way to cut ties with that era of their lives, while also, in her words, bruising Howard's ego. At the end of Season 5, Kim and Jimmy discuss trying to create a plan to take down Howard a couple pegs. Kim knows that Howard has numerous professional connections along with access to resources, and if something were to happen to his reputation, he would be able to bounce back with little to no consequence. In comparison, Kim is starting to build those professional connections, but a hit to her reputation would be far more detrimental, especially after watching how Chuck treated his own brother and how Jimmy was treated during the hearings for his law license. Jimmy seems to defer to Kim throughout this season, almost hesitant to respond until she gives confirmation that his more nefarious leanings are acceptable. Jimmy, his brother, was the main focus of his vitriol, and Howard was more of a target to get out his remaining frustrations. But Kim giving him a go-ahead is confirmation to continue their path of revenge. They foiled our plot. We must have revenge. Revenge. Vengeance. Revenge. Payback is ours. The mini egg rolls are done. Delicious, hot, revenge, revenge, egg roll. To truly be able to escape poverty means being able to see the big picture. This is one of the reasons I think Kim is a great representation of the skills that a character would need to develop in order to do so. Kim wants to put her time at HHM behind her, which means finding a resolution to the Sandpiper class action case. If finding a resolution to the case also smears Howard's name in the process even better. She manages to take this a step further and get the Kettlemans involved. Kim has reason to be angry with the Kettlemans. Back in Season 1, the Kettleman family haphazardly embezzled a large sum of money from the county because they're dumb criminals. When they sought representation from the HHM law firm, Kim managed to get a ridiculous sweetheart deal for the couple if the husband took a plea deal. However, the wife Betsy was unhappy with this, insisting that they were innocent, and fired her as their attorney. When this happened, Howard exiled Kim to the cornfield or dock review, blaming her for their clients being unreasonable. Without Kim knowing, Jimmy confronted the Kettlemans, explaining that the deal Kim managed to obtain for them would be their best chance because of how stupidly they carried out their crime. Kim is treated horribly by both Howard and the Kettlemans throughout the process. Kim despises those who go out of their way to scam the poor and elderly, so including this couple in their plans is another opportunity for her to exact revenge and obtain closure. How lavish a lifestyle would you lead if you were the richest man on earth? In this world-exclusive edition of Lifestyles, we'll explore the fabulous private domains of Adnan Khashoggi, whose globe-trolling existence is so unbelievably lush, it has inspired blockbuster movies and novels, which only pale in comparison to the true story you will see in the next 60 minutes. Jimmy reaches out to the Kettlemans first to get the ball rolling. It's clear the Kettlemans have had a fall from grace as they are working out of a trailer in the middle of nowhere with their business titled Sweet Liberty Tax Service. The business is a title that is meant to evoke a more hometown generic yet folksy feel. As Betsy prints a check for an elderly client, the camera pans around the room, highlighting the patriotic imagery and music being played. The over-the-top Americana gives an uncomfortable feeling that there is something dishonest about the business, but we aren't sure how yet. When Saul enters the trailer, Betsy Kettleman is instantly angry. As Jimmy and the Kettlemans talk, Betsy angrily states, We lost everything, our kids are in public school. This harkens back to the earlier seasons where the image of the family is of high importance to Betsy. She even tried using her husband's good name as leverage for their case. The anger she has in her kids attending the dreaded public school speaks to how much she attaches her image to who she is as a person. I won't get into the private versus public school debate here, but I will share this quote from US News. Robert Pianta, who led a study published in 2018 that examines academic, social, psychological, and attainment outcomes, says he found student success is more directly related to family attributes, such as having college-educated parents and higher incomes than which school they attend. When you compare children who went to private school for an average of six years with those who only went to public school, any apparent benefits of private schooling, higher test scores, for example, are entirely attributable to parents' education and outcome, he says. The fact that they went to private school does not account for any differences we might see, end quote. When Saul hints that there is a chance for Mr. Kettleman to be exonerated, at first they don't believe him when he suggests that the attorney on their case was under the influence of illegal substances. But Jimmy manages to plant that seed of thought. Instead of thinking it's Howard, however, Miss Kettleman's response was, quote, that awful woman with the ponytail is a sugar addict? Betsy clearly still has negative feelings toward Kim, and while socioeconomic status may have some effect on why she suspected Kim first, it appears her attitude is rooted more in misogyny. When the Kettlemans go to Davis in Maine, Betsy describes Aaron as a, quote, prepubescent intern and refused to talk to her, demanding to speak with Maine instead. 
The second time Jimmy meets with the Kettlemans, Kim is with him. Upon entering, Kim observes an elderly lady leaving with a check. As Jimmy speaks with the Kettlemans, Kim walks around the trailer, observing the setup, heavily focusing on the certificate of achievements on the wall. She listens to Betsy argue with Saul that he used their good name to character assassinate Howard, and that they want their lives back. But it's not necessarily about the money, it's the prestige. It's not until Betsy says they lost everything and didn't deserve any of this, that Kim loses her patience. Kim knows what it means to lose everything, and from looking at the business around her, the Kettlemans didn't lose everything. Their situation is a result of their own actions, even if they don't want to admit it to themselves. Not only does Kim easily break down how their scam works, but calls the IRS while on speaker, showing the Kettlemans that not only does she not have any qualms about turning them in, but she now has connections in the office to drive the point home that she, too, has a good name. Betsy panics and hangs up the phone before Kim is able to share more information with the agency, pleading that they'll do anything to avoid government intervention. Kim's frustration in their scam at the elderly reverberates in her calm tone when she sternly says, quote, Betsy, you'll probably get 24 months, maybe 18, with good behavior. But Craig, you are a two-time loser, and they will definitely make an example out of you. Each false return they discover will be a separate felony. What are we talking, 100, 200? First, you contact every person you ripped off. Tell them you made an accounting error. Tell them you're crooks, you had a change of heart. I don't care. Give them what they're legally owed, everything you stole. And then after that, you're going to forget you ever heard the name Howard Hamlin. I'm keeping my eye on both of you. You think you've lost everything? You have no idea." End quote. Their plan is continuing to progress, and Kim was granted an opportunity to voice her pointing opinion to the Kettlemans. As Kim leads on the car outside, taking in the breeze, a weight has been lifted off her shoulders from being this arbiter of justice. She knows Jimmy still paid off the Kettlemans, but now there is added insurance if they don't comply with Kim's demands, they will be turned into the IRS. Who are you? I'm from the IRS, and I've come to attack your... Episode 6 starts with Kim around middle school age being caught for shoplifting. When her mom enters the scene, she puts on a show about how Kim is going to be punished and that the manager should go ahead and call the police. Kim says very little and keeps her head bowed throughout the interaction, even when her mom says, quote, I don't know what's gotten into her. She's a straight A student, always got her nose in a book. When they're both in the car after, her mom hands her a necklace that we aren't sure was shoplifted or not and says, quote, I didn't know you had it in you. See, your mom's good for something. From this experience at a young age, Kim sees that consequences are more of a gray area. By putting on a show and being pleasant toward the security guard, she was able to get out of pain for the necklace that Kim broke, while trying to shoplift, seemingly facing no negative consequences whatsoever. I think this feeds into why Kim views their plan as nothing more than a blip in Howard's career. Howard is able to schmooze and talk his way out of difficult situations, he dresses affluently, has professional connections, access to resources. So what consequences is he actually going to suffer? Howard managed to keep the law firm afloat after buying out Chuck's part of the company. He kept his estate, country club membership, his Jaguar, fancy suits. It isn't until later in season six that it's revealed Howard's marriage is heavily struggling and that the law firm is being bought by another company and moved in to a smaller space. In the first episode, before Jimmy goes into the country club to plant the substance in Howard's locker, he learns that Kim knows how to play golf. Kim has adapted to several types of situations, so learning how to play golf in order to fit in with other attorneys and clientele makes sense. And of course, she's willing to teach Jimmy how to play as well. Until season six, Kim has worn very plain professional clothes that often do not have patterns. The suits are lower to mid-level quality, but in season six, it has improved. She has more patterned blouses, likely an influence from Jimmy's bright wardrobe, but also that she is starting to take on some of the questionable ethics as him. Her suit basics are usually black or dark brown, higher quality materials, and cut to fit her better. The apartment is slightly nicer with few upgraded decorations. She lives more on the economical side, but has started to accept a few things. Her wardrobe updated, but she goes back to driving the reliable Mercury. Kim is able to play the part when she mingles with wealthy attorneys, but at her heart, doesn't embrace their lavish lifestyles. However, she encourages Jimmy to upgrade his car and office if he's going to now practice law as Saul Goodman. When Kim is in Florida, her clothing and hair are completely transformed. She lives in a trailer home, mostly void of decoration, and could be mistaken for something off of the factory floor. Her clothes are generic and mostly shapeless. Even though she is in an environment that is vastly different from when she was an attorney, Kim is still hesitant to share much of herself. However, she doesn't look down on her co-workers and she joins in when they have lunch or celebrate birthdays, but there is an unspoken distance she maintains. There is also a slight change in how she handles herself. Throughout most of the series, Kim's confidence in being logical and decisive grows. In her life in Florida, her confidence in making decisions has greatly decreased, 
back to where it was at the start of the show. When Kim is making potato salad, both she and her partner are unsure if Miracle Whip instead of mayonnaise will be okay. Later in the office, she is working on a brochure and goes back and forth on the wording in one sentence, similar to season one when she is working late on legal documents and heavily focuses on one sentence. When Kim leaves Florida to speak with Howard's wife Cheryl, she wears heels and dresses up a bit more than she had previously, but it's certainly a far cry from her usual appearance as an attorney. Howard's death is the moment Kim realized she may have flown too close to the sun. For the most part, until this occurred, Kim was right about what choices should be made and her ability to make professional connections vastly improved. Her confidence grew, but she started to get sloppy. Season 6 shows what happens when Kim doesn't have a failsafe. Before the Sandpiper meeting, Kim and Saul find out that the mediator has a broken arm, so the pictures they created need to be remade. Saul is willing to try and regroup to figure out the next steps at a later time, but Kim is not. When she hears the news, she immediately starts processing to determine if there is another way to carry out their scheme. Unable to determine a plan B, she tells Jimmy that it has to be today before immediately turning the car around, missing a different important meeting. As a kid, Kim did not face any consequences for stealing the necklace. As an attorney, she watched wealthy defendants escape any significant punishment. When their plan finally reaches its end in Episode 7, and there is a resolution to the Sandpiper case, Howard makes a fateful stop to Kim and Jimmy's apartment. With a bottle of wine, he tells them they won. Jimmy plays stupid, wondering what this is about. To which Howard responds, quote, I was wondering that too, what it's all about. I mean, what do you tell yourselves? What justification makes it okay? Howard, such an asshole, he deserves it. Well, what is it? I sided with Chuck too often. I took away your office, put you in doc review, all of the above. Howard's daddy helping him get to the top, but you both had to struggle. Howard had too much and we have so little. Let's take him down a peg or two. What allows you to do this to me? Because this isn't just a prank, no. This goes beyond throwing bowling balls on my car. This took planning, coordination. I mean, how many weeks? Or was it months? It couldn't have been easy, so tell me why. Why go through this elaborate plot just to burn me to the ground? As Howard vents all this, Kim and Jimmy remain silent. After a pause, Jimmy's response sums up how they viewed the situation, quote, Burn it to the ground, Howard? Come on, you'll be fine. You always land on your feet. Seeing how much their plan affected Howard gives them resolve, and they smirk at each other when Howard explains where his life is at. This is clearly something that Howard has been holding in for a long time. He continues with his rant, quote, yeah, sure, the Sandpiper settlement, HHM's share will be substantial, absolutely. Even though I humiliated myself, my clients and peers will whisper that Howard Hamlin's an addict. You're right, I've worked my way through worse. Debt, depression, my marriage falling apart. Yeah, I've been sleeping in the guest house for the better part of a year. Just one more thing, that good old Howard has to work through. But yes, I will land on my feet. I will be okay, but you, far from it. You two, you two are soulless. It's noteworthy that the camera points at Kim first instead of Jimmy when Howard says the word soulless. Jimmy, you can't help yourself. Chuck knew it. You were born that way. But Kim, one of the smartest and most promising human beings I've ever known, and this is the life you choose? It's interesting that Howard is now super complimentary to Kim. If she was that smart and promising, why wasn't that reflected in how she was treated at HHM? At this point, it's too little too late. Not only that, but Howard's words to Jimmy aren't as harsh as when he talks to Kim. With Jimmy, he expected him to be this way. With Kim, it's almost as if he feels hurt that he sees this shift in her personality. However, he never truly saw Kim to begin with. It isn't until Howard is affected by Kim's actions that he really pays her any mind. After she tells him to go home, Howard responds that, quote, You're perfect for each other. Screw the money. You did it for fun. You get off on it. You're like Leopold and Loeb, two sociopaths. For those who don't know, Leopold and Loeb are American criminals from the early 1900s and described as highly intelligent. They believed they were above the law and could commit the perfect crime without being caught. Kim and Saul would certainly understand this reference and the assertions that Howard is making. Before Lalo puts a permanent end to Howard's career, one of the last things Howard says is, you know it's true, you just don't have the guts to admit it. Kim's visceral reaction to Howard's death in front of her was a shocking realization of what the consequences of her actions could be. When she was caught shoplifting, she anticipated harsher consequences, yet nothing happened. Contrast that with the confrontation in the apartment, and Kim was certainly not anticipating that Howard would be unalived instead of embarrassed. Oh, hello. I was just working on a multi-million dollar lawsuit for one of my clients. I know what you're thinking. Hey, a lawsuit sounds great. But Saul, who can I sue? Who can you sue? Try police departments, libraries, construction companies. In the opening sequence for the series, Jimmy's ornately decorated house is being emptied. 
At first, the items are run-of-the-mill luxury items such as an entire room of fancy suits and statues throughout the home. As it progresses, the camera focuses on smaller items of sentimental value. First, there is the stuffed toy he was originally going to give the clerk at the court to get a hearing date. It was the moment he realized that after defending Lalo, he was now seen as a scumbag lawyer. People were quick to shut him out. The interpersonal connections he had in court started to dissipate. The next item is his brother's copy of The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. Since this video is focused on Kim, I won't focus on this item. In the last frame as the house is being cleared out, the tequila topper from Kim falls on the ground. The homage to Citizen Kane shows that Kim was Jimmy's rosebud. Saul is on the run from the feds, he leaves behind both the luxurious and the sentimental items. The sentimental items represent the good pieces of his life that he still held onto when he went by Jimmy instead of Saul. At the end of episode 12, after Kim meets with Jimmy to sign divorce papers, she sees a glimpse of where his path is headed and that he has embraced this persona of Saul Goodman, setting up his character for Breaking Bad. The intoxication of money is something he cannot resist. As she stands outside smoking a cigarette while it's raining, Jesse Pinkman has a conversation with her and asks if Saul is any good. Before she runs out her car in the rain, she tells him, quote, When I knew him, he was. Any traces of Jimmy that Kim knew are now gone. In Florida, Kim isn't working to impress those around her. In episode 12, when she's at a barbecue, the discussions are shallow and mundane. They are all pleasant, and while there's a bit of fakeness on the surface, it's nothing compared to what Kim dealt with when she practiced law. When work heavily consumes our time, it's easy to forget that there is a life outside of that. When Jimmy finds out that Kim inquired about whether or not he was okay, he calls her at her job in Florida from a payphone. She picks up the phone and listens to Jimmy's frustrations. When she tells him to turn himself in, he is surprised and tells him, quote, You heard me. I don't know what kind of life you've been living, but it can't be much. Jimmy accuses her of the same, and she is taken aback. He tells her, quote, You have no idea what I did or didn't do, okay? And why didn't you turn yourself in, seeing as you're the one with the guilty conscience, huh? What is stopping you? Frings in the ground, Mike's in the ground, Lalo's in the ground, apparently. You don't have to hold back on my account. They can only hang me once, so go ahead. Spill your guts, put on your hair shirt, and see what it gets you, Kim. Why are we even talking about this? We're both too smart to throw our lives away for no reason, end quote. Before she hangs up, she tells him that she's glad he's alive while fighting back tears. Kim recognizes that she needs to address her past to resolve this part of her life and flies to Albuquerque to meet with Howard's widow, Cheryl, as well as submit an affidavit to the court about what really happened to Howard. Cheryl tells Kim that she can sue her in civil court, taking everything she has, and Kim acknowledges that possibility. After taking responsibility for her actions, she has an emotional outburst in the bus at the airport and breaks down crying. She has fully confronted what happened, recognizing what she was capable of. This is similar to some of the steps of AA, recognizing that you are an alcoholic and addressing those you hurt. Alcoholics Anonymous is a problematic organization, but this part of the episode is a reference back to Days of Wine and Roses when Joe tries to stop drinking. There is a sense of closure. Kim doesn't have to hide these secrets anymore, and she is starting to regain her sense of self. When Kim was an attorney, if she messed up, she took the blame and addressed the situation head on. After years of avoiding her past, she is able to start making less destructive decisions, starting with submitting the affidavit and speaking with Cheryl. Previously, when Kim was actively practicing law, there did not appear to be other people trying to help. Prior to seeing Cheryl, Kim is at the courthouse to submit her affidavit and notices another attorney helping a client put on a tie to prepare for court. She sees a vision of her former self and has the realization that she doesn't have to fight the injustice and the legal system alone. There are other attorneys willing to share the burden. When Kim returns to Florida, she leaves work early one day to volunteer at an attorney office that offers free legal services. A couple of women are already waiting in the front of the office as the attorney is speaking with a pregnant woman in a domestic violence situation. The attorney lets Kim help immediately by answering phones, also mentioning the air conditioner isn't working. Not having a functional AC in Florida is at minimum uncomfortable, but at worst detrimental. The office is not fancy, but it's functional. Kim doesn't feel out of place and she hasn't lost that sense of wanting to help. The spark her character had from the start of the series is starting to return as she seamlessly fits into this environment. While filing papers, Kim receives a call from Suzanne that Jimmy has a court case and some of it is related to her. Even though he was able to get his jail time down to a ridiculously low amount, when he sees Kim sitting in the back of the courtroom, he torpedoes the deal, confessing everything, and instead of 7 years prison time, ends up with 86 years. After this, Kim visits Saul in jail, claiming to be his attorney. They share a cigarette while leaning against the wall like they did in season 1 in the parking garage at HHM. Kim is back to wearing a suit and heels for this part of the episode and tells Jimmy that her bar card in New Mexico doesn't have an expiration date. I'm not sure if that would allow her to practice law in Florida, but as their paths diverge, 
the future for Kim is hopeful. Even if she doesn't return as an attorney, she isn't going to leave the law entirely, and she knows she needs to leave behind the self-destructive influences. Kim's ending in season 6 is hopeful. She is starting over again, but this time won't have the influence of Jimmy. She addresses her past and is able to assess what she needs to do next to be more successful. Jimmy is more self-destructive, but does recognize he can't escape it forever and takes responsibility, recognizing he could lose Kim forever. The connection between the two is still there, but they recognize they are better apart than they are together. Kim has had to rebuild her life before and can do it again. Thanks for making it this far. Until next time.